Um, so thanks to our sponsor, Fitness Labs. Fitness Labs works on custom software projects that require a significant investment of time, money, and energy from businesses. They help by defining goals and scope, managing the process, and ensuring goals are achieved. Thanks, Fitness Labs, for being a local sponsor. And be on the lookout. We are having an attendee survey sent out after the conference. We would love your feedback to make sure that 2024's Thunder Plains is even better. And now for our next speaker. Meet Matt Jones, a senior software developer with 11 years of expertise in the .NET world. He's your go-to guy for implementing full stack applications and isn't afraid to dabble in React and other JavaScript frameworks. When he's not coding, Matt enjoys soccer, golf, and quality time with his family. Today, Matt will take us on a journey familiar to many companies. They were content with .NET Razor pages until Blazor's production release opened doors to a new front-end framework. But rather than jumping into the next Microsoft stack, they explored and compared Blazor, React, and Vue. Matt will share the factors they loved, hated, and remained indifferent about, leading to their choice of Blazor as their SPA framework. Join us for insights from Matt's decision-making process and a glimpse into the Blazor journey. All right, why we chose Blazor over React and Vue. Um, real quick, just kind of want to do a quick survey. Is anybody currently using Blazor out there? Hey, my people, all right. Any, any .NET people? OK, quite a few of you. Awesome. So uh, just real quick again, I'm Matt Jones, senior software developer at 1898 Co., a part of Burns & McDonald. Uh, I'm based out of Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, primarily been doing .NET development for 11, 11 and a half years now primarily as a software consultant. And so what that means is we're typically going to our clients. We are solving their problems typically with a .NET web app of some sort, some data integration of some sort, or some cloud development of some sort. Again, I want to make sure everybody's clear on this one. This is not meant to be a Blazor sales pitch. So Blazor's probably not the right framework for everybody. Emphasis on probably. Uh, I'm a little biased. Sorry if that kind of bleeds through in this presentation a little bit. Um, but really, this is meant to be kind of our journey for how we got to Blazor. So we were on Razor Pages before, but again, we didn't want to jump straight to Blazor and just, just go with it. We wanted to make sure that we took our time, we evaluated the different options out there, and we made the right decision for us and to be successful in the future. So this is really meant to be our retooly journey. Why I wrote this talk specifically, we had a client conversation, and this still resonates with me all the time, the specific quote we had with the client was uh, after they found out that we were using Blazor, this talk came up and they said, hey, we're actually going to choose what framework we're going to use for our spa on Friday this week. Which one should we choose? Right, that didn't make any sense to us. We had spent a couple months, a couple weeks trying to figure out what we were going to do moving forward. They were just going to flip a coin and say, yeah, we're going to do this, we're going to do React, or we're going to do Blazor, or we're going to do Angular, or something along those lines. After kind of talking to them a little bit more in that same conversation, um, we got the idea that they were using .NET for their back end. On the front end, they really had no common denominator. They had a couple people doing HTML, jQuery, CSS, but that was really it. And they're not alone in this journey, right? There's a lot of us that are here even today, right, where you're trying to get insights on what people are doing, trying to make decisions moving forward, what are the cool new trends going on right now. And so this is really something that, you know, they're not alone in this journey, but again, they didn't have any direction. They were going to flip a coin, basically, is what it seemed like. So why were we trying to move away from Razor Pages? We had been working on Razor Pages for, I don't know, three years, four years. And it was OK. Emphasis again on the OK. It was never like perfect. It was never really great. We didn't really enjoy it a ton. But it allowed us to really execute our projects. We were successful. We were getting them done. We were getting them done on time, delivering to the clients. They were happy. We were kind of happy. Right, and I've listed a couple things up here that you know specifically were you know felt wrong or not quite right in our opinions. Um, I'm not going to go into too many of those things, but some of the ones, the anti-forgery token, always makes me laugh. If anybody's familiar with the anti-forgery token, it's a security measure put in place to help secure your communication from your front end to your back end with Razor Pages. Typically, all it needs is one line of code, just one line of code. You forget that one line of code your afternoon is probably gone, trying to debug that situation. 
And that has happened way too many times to me and the rest of our team. So that's one specific example. Another example is, again, with our Razor Pages applications. Um, we're doing a lot of .NET on the back end, your typical C Sharp, .end. Um, we had situations where we had kind of a microservice architecture, you'd, so you'd have an MVC API over here, some Razor Pages front end over here. Things were okay. Um, we enjoyed the MVC side of things. But on our Razor side of things, we tend to have, I don't know, 10, 50, 100 lines of Razor syntax, and then tenfold of that in jQuery JavaScript to get done the UI side of things that we needed done. So we were already kind of splitting our skill set here and writing tons and tons and tons of jQuery to get done what we needed to in Razor. Again, just a couple more things that were just like, this doesn't feel quite right to us. Kind of a square peg in a round hole sort of situation. And then on the other side of things, from the Microsoft world, it seemed, and this started probably about two years ago when we took this journey, um, the writing was already kind of on the wall for Razor Pages, and it still feels that way to us today. So if anybody's familiar with .NET Conf, a uh, good conference that's out starting next week, uh, free, it's a really good one, it's all virtual. Um, if you go and look at the agenda for that, you're not gonna see a single topic or single conversation about Razor Pages. You will see tons of them about Blazor though. And this was already the case two years ago when we were kind of going through this journey. So the writing already seemed to be on the wall then, and it certainly is now that Razor Pages was kind of getting phased out. You know, the support for it may still be there, but you're not gonna be getting those new features that everybody's looking for. So that's really where Blazor kind of stepped in. And this is when we started to decide, you know what, why are we still putting up with this? Why are we doing this? We're seeing all these people at conferences talking about how much they love React, how much they love you. We've considered Blazor already. It's probably time for us to take action. And that is when we embarked on our pilot project here. I have up on the screen here, pilot project is greater than hello world. I'll kind of come back to that, but um, I'm gonna steal a quote from the .NET Rocks podcast, episode 1800. Uh, they had a guest on there, Heather Downing, and she said this specifically, I have a love-hate relationship with hello world. And that has really resonated with me to this day ever since I heard that. If the tool that you're using, the library that you're using, the framework you're using makes it really, really easy to get in and get Hello World up on your screen, awesome. But if everything after that is really, really painful, it's probably not the right tool. So again, if Hello World is the only thing they're doing right, definitely not the right tool. And so that's where that love-hate relationship comes in. Everybody wants that quick gratification of getting up and running, but you need to go deeper than that. And uh, so we'll go into the pilot project and kind of the other factors that we kind of talked about too that led us towards our decision. In our pilot project, we had a couple things, hopefully you guys can read that, um, a couple things that we wanted to keep consistent across uh, the pilot project. So we had built out an MVC backend uh, using .NET that was gonna be the same across all three front ends. We had three of our team members um, set out to build the same front end using the three different frameworks. So we built one with React, one with Review, or one with Vue, and one with Blazor. In that pilot project, I specifically am highlighting the Telerik grid on here. We'll talk about that one specifically uh, and why. Uh, another component library of some sort, and then with those component libraries, they need to be consistent with, or at least support the material theme. So our team had bought in on the material UI standards. Um, we're, not, we're not UI UX people, we've got a UI UX person, but the material theme has really kind of helped simplify what we're doing, so it gives us kind of that standard look and feel and set of standards that we can work with. Form data entry, um, that's pretty common stuff. You know, you gotta be able to do your CRUD operations. If you can't do that, then that's probably not gonna work. Uh, we have way too many engineers that love the term Google-like search. So, okay, fine. We'll put in a search bar with autocomplete of some sort in this pilot project. And then the final item I've got up here is a mapping component. And I put in parentheses a bonus here. We have a lot of GIS-related data, geospatial data, that we work with on a pretty regular basis. So, um, I put this as a bonus because I think we already kind of had a good feeling for where this was gonna fall into the three different frameworks. Uh, mapping components tend to be pretty JavaScript heavy, and uh, we'll talk about that one a little bit more specifically. So not like a super complicated front end, but something to at least get us a little bit deeper than Hello World, right? 
In here, I'm going to talk specifically about the Telerik grid. So if anybody's familiar with Telerik or Kendo UI, um, they've got a really, really nice set of components and component libraries out there. And there's more to it, too. They've got some document processing and some other tools out there, too. But it is a paid license to use their tools. Now, the grid specifically has saved us so, so, so much time. So again, I mentioned engineers. We work at an engineering firm. And a lot of our problems to start the applications that we're building or requirements are coming to us to build projects, they come from engineers who have taken an Excel spreadsheet and they cannot get away from it. They love, love, love their spreadsheets. They have a spreadsheet that's 15 megs. It doesn't hardly open. They have way too much data into it, way too many uh, pivot tables, way too much macros. It's just awful. And so that's where a lot of our problems come from. And from that, we don't only build grid-based web apps or grid-based solutions, but it certainly helps with adoption and getting those users into these applications and making them feel more comfortable with the solutions that we're building. So the Teller Grid has certainly saved us tons and tons of time in that space. And then component libraries, another component library outside of Telerik was something we wanted to explore too. With Telerik, again, I mentioned that it's a paid model for licenses to work with. Now, there's certain situations that's not going to work for our clients. So there's times where we're going to come in, we're going to build a solution, we're going to ship it to a client's environment, and then we're done. We hand it off to them, their IT, their hosting in their environment, their development team. That happens enough to where this is something that we needed to explore. When we do that, the client's going to need to have a paid license to Telerik 2. And so again, that's not something that's always going to work for our clients. And so we needed to at least kind of explore what other options there were out there. I realize now, after seeing some of the presentations, that some of the dark screen may be a little tough to read. So I apologize. We'll still talk about this. But yes, I am a dark theme person. Sorry for you light, light themers out there. On the left, we've got a Blazor implementation of a Telerik grid. On the right, we've got a React one. Now, both pretty simple. On the Blazor side of things, we've got some Razor syntax. It looks kind of like XML. Um, it's got six columns, and it's got sortable equals true. That's all you need to sort a grid, display a grid, and make each of those columns sortable. Sortable equals true. That's pretty nice. On the React side of things, You've got three columns. I could have put six in there. I put three. It still gets the example across. Sortable equals true. Sort equals sort. On sort change, set my sort. That's now three, four, a couple different things that you need to do just for the sorting. So sortable equals true, or sort equals true, sort equals sort, on sort change, set my sort. There's a couple different things you got to remember in there. And so right away, the blazer side of things was certainly a little bit more appealing. Again, some perspective on the React side of things, though. Again, we, weren't, we were trying to hide our bias, right? We're trying to make sure that we're giving everything a fair chance. And you know, it really came to us like, hey, I can actually inject my own sorting algorithm in here if I wanted to. Or if I have really smart people that are doing nothing but sort or come to the table with some really, really strong sorting algorithm, you can inject that into React really easily. OK, that's kind of cool, actually. That's kind of nice. All right, that's so, you know, maybe not necessarily a, a super negative here, but for us, sortable, equal, sortable equals true has been kind of key here. And, and kind of the same thing applies for other different options within that grid. Pageable equals true, filterable equals true. That's all it needs. There's quite a bit more to the React and View side of things. From the components library side of things, um, I've got three listed up here with the fourth one. We'll talk a little bit more about that fourth one here. Uh, MUI, I may be pronouncing that incorrectly, I understand that. Uh, Beautify and Mudblazer. Those are going to be the material themed component libraries that we found specifically to support this pilot project. They're both pretty supported, um, very easy to use, so no really complaints from any of those three. You know, those pilot projects went pretty smooth with those. The final one with custom DevOps artifacts. Um, so we have bought into Azure DevOps. You know, boo, yay, you know, depending on what side of the house you, you fall in here. What we can do and what we have the option to do, now we're not doing it all the time, but there's still the option now with custom DevOps artifacts, is we could actually host that privately and pull those into our projects. So when we start making components or reusable chunks of code, we could host those through NuGet, NPM, PIP, Maven, what have you. And that's already done for us. So you know, we could take these, these component libraries and Mudblazer, go build our own, and kind of blend them into our solutions. So that was certainly a win. And again, there wasn't really a downfall here for any of the different options, but certainly something to consider. 
Uh, search with autocomplete, I'm not gonna go to this one too much. They were both pretty straightforward. And I understand that again, sometimes it might be a little tricky to read some of the dark screen, but not too much to this. They were both pretty simple and straightforward to implement. So a lot of the other components were pretty nice. And then again, from the mapping component, we again kind of had an idea of, of what this was gonna look like. Blazor was not anywhere on the map for this one, no pun intended. But uh, you know, the Google Maps API, Leaflet, Cesium, other like ArcGIS from Esri, these are all really, really strong JavaScript libraries that we considered and we have used in the past. So, you know, if we were gonna go that Blazor route, which we did, we were still gonna need to have to write JavaScript if we have a mapping component. So that was something that, you know, still had to be in our mind when we were trying to make this decision. Moving a little bit outside of the strict development of that pilot project, there are other things that we wanted to consider too, and that's what we're gonna kinda get into now. I've got on here learning curve and documentation is kinda the next thing that we wanted to talk about. Learning curve, we had an idea of what this was gonna look like from the .NET side of things with the Blazor side. It was probably gonna be a little bit quicker than React and Vue, and it was, you know, full disclosure it was, but the magnitude of it we'll talk about in a little bit. But from the documentation side of things, again, from the hello world side of things, we need to make sure there's good examples out there. Two years ago, Blazor was still pretty new. So, you know, were we too bleeding edge to have good examples, have good blog posts, have good Stack Overflow questions, right? If, you're, if you can't go find a Stack Overflow answer to the problem that you're having, that's a problem. And, and you know, this was, again, pre-ChatGPT and pre-Copilot, but if those questions and answers aren't on Stack Overflow, are we the ones having to make those and try and figure that out? That would be a pretty big concern for us because you know, how, how long could that delay you if you can't find the answer for what you're looking for? So these are all things we wanted to consider. From the documentation side of things, both had pretty good docs. They were pretty easy to use. Again, a little bit biased. We're used to the Microsoft docs, so this was a, a straight one-to-one. -one. We we're using the Microsoft docs for um, our MVC projects, our Razor page projects, and that just transitioned straight into the Blazor projects. So no issues there. And again, we were already using C Sharp for our logic, so that was an easy transition. From React and Vue, it was also a pretty easy transition there. The documentation was really good. There was quite a bit of examples out there, plenty of blog posts. I put a little caveat in here of React hooks versus class components. So when we did this, the React documentation was not very clear that, hey, all your friends, their friends, their grandmas, they're all using React hooks. You should use that. We did not see that on the documentation and it was not super clear to us, so we did it through class components. Um, we realize now that you know maybe we would have changed our mind about React, but here we are. We didn't do it with React hooks, so you know there's a little bit of a caveat to that, and uh, definitely want to recognize that. The duration that it actually took to execute this pilot project was a huge win for the Blazor side of things. And again, there's going to be some bias here. You know, we're familiar with C sharp, familiar with that logic, but we weren't familiar with Blazor. And the guy that took and did the Blazor project. It took him one night to do this, build that pilot project in a single night. The two of us that were working on React and Vue, it took us two weeks of working nights, weekends, whenever we could find time, right, with busy schedules to actually get this implemented. And so when we sat down and had that conversation with him, like, what the hell, man, you did this in a night? So that was a huge, huge win for our team for Blazor. And again, you know, a little bit of bias here. So, um, you know, if your team's already strong in TypeScript, you know, that may be something that happens a little bit different, right? Your Blazor timeline may take a little bit longer. But for us, again, that Blazor guy took him one night. That was a huge win if we could take what we're doing now and spend quite a bit less time moving forward. Talking about talent pool and team structure, um, kind of building off the last talk a little bit from this, um, we're gonna talk about LinkedIn here shortly, but um, our team structure is certainly something we had to consider too. So we're software consultants and we're working on a lot of greenfield applications. Sometimes our projects are really big scale. You have a whole team of developers, five, six, seven, eight, ten, 10, however many developers. Sometimes you have one. And so if there's a clear divide of work, you know, are we gonna be in a problem here? If we've got five React developers and five .NET developers and we've got a ton of React work or not a ton of uh, .NET work, what's that gonna do to our project and our team structure, right? Who are we gonna have to go hire for, re or who are we gonna have to go put Rex out to hire for? So these are something that we wanted to consider too. I'm gonna show a LinkedIn. I know the numbers are probably gonna be pretty small, so I'll read them specifically. Um, we had an idea of what this was gonna be too, but this was, 
pretty drastically different from uh, in favor of the React and Vue side of things. So just going to LinkedIn, searching for React.js, and clicking people. So how many people have React in their profile of some way, shape, or form? About 3 million. There's 2.8 million people. That's a lot of people, right? It's a big fish. There's a lot of people out there. You could probably go find a React person tomorrow if you needed to hire somebody. So that, that was a big win, right? You know, the people are out there, the resources are available. Vue, uh, about a half a million, 512,000 people. So still quite a few people out there. Probably a little bit tougher to find a Vue person, but um, chances are you're going to find that person. Blazor, not so much, 34,000. And this is actually from about a month ago. So this is like recent, recent. So imagine that two years ago, that, that number was probably way, way less. And uh, so, I mean, that was a concern. That was a concern right there. And kind of to build on that, we've been interviewing since that two years. We've interviewed a ton of .NET people, and not a single one of them has ever said that, yes, I have worked on Blazor. So, you know, take what you will with that. They've all picked up Blazor pretty quickly. but. I kind of the moral story of the, of the staffing pool is if you wanted to find a React person tomorrow, you probably could. That Blazor person, they're going to be a lot tougher to find, and they may not be looking for a job either. Who knows? Moving into the developer experience, right? You know, if you're, when you're building these applications, are you having a good time? Are we frustrated with this similar to how we were frustrated with Razor Pages? You know, we didn't want to go from some tool that we didn't really love or some framework we didn't really love into something we didn't really love again, right? You know, you wanted to have a good time when you were developing, when you were working, you wanted to enjoy it. And then the tooling available, um, what sort of options are out there from an IDE perspective, from um, other third-party libraries, things along those lines. From this side of house, we were very familiar, obviously, from the .NET space with Visual Studio. VS Code, of course, we use that all the time. This was pretty universal for both, for, for all three of the different frameworks. So no real complaint here. There were tons and tons of examples or uh, templates, especially from the Visual Studio professional side of things for Blazor, for React, for Vue, so no real complaints there. Now on the second icon there, there's a little fire icon. If you're familiar with this one, this is actually the hot reload icon out of Visual Studio. People love hot reload, and myself included. We want that instant gratification, right? I'm, deep, I'm in a debugging session. I see something I don't like, or I see a bug, I want to go change it immediately. Hit save, I want to see that reflected in the browser. Hot Reload works really, really well for React and Vue, right? Works awesome. For Blazor, it's, it's kind of hit or miss. It's kind of hit or miss, and I don't know if that's going to get a ton better than it is right now. It's gotten better, but I don't know how much better it's going to get, because it's still got to compile that down to WebAssembly and get that pushed out there. And some of that process, you know, is still kind of out there for me, but I don't know if it's going to get a ton better. So that was something that we wanted to consider too. And then the third icon uh, is the GitHub Copilot icon. So I mentioned that this wasn't really around two years ago, so it didn't factor into our decision. But if you're using Copilot today, it's a really, really powerful tool, right? It really helps with some of those things that you don't want to spend a ton of time thinking and things that you've already done, it's a really good option for you. And same thing with ChatGPT. With Copilot today, I've never really gotten strong Razor syntax out of it to fuel my Blazor. So that's you know, something to consider, right? I've always been able to get really good TypeScript, whether it's with React, Vue, or just plain TypeScript. So probably a win on the JavaScript side of the house. Now ChatGPT is a little bit different story. I've had plenty of success getting tons of Razor uh, syntax out of ChatGPT. So you know, it just depends on what tools you have in your tool belt at that point in time. CICD, everybody's favorite thing to talk about, maybe not necessarily do. Um, I mentioned that we're on the Azure DevOps side of things. So specifically, how did this play into our build pipelines, our release pipelines? What did this look like for us? Where were, where were we going to see this? You know, everybody loves learning YAML, right? So um, this, is, this is not something that we're super familiar with. We're familiar enough. We know where the documentation is. We know how to kind of dig through it, but sure as heck do not like to write YAML. So what's this going to look for us if we go down the Blazor route? What's it going to look like if we go down a React route or a Vue route? And quite frankly, they look pretty similar. And I guess after seeing how similar they look, you know, okay, yeah, that makes total sense. I guess they would be similar. So 
On the .NET side of things, you've got your specify your version, use .NET 7. I need to restore it, .NET restore, I need to .NET build, and then I need to package things up to publish them out to um, my release pipeline. On the React View side of things, it's pretty much the same, just with some different commands. I need to specify what version, so I've got Node 16, 18, 20, whatever version of Node you're using. I've got to do an npm install, so I've got to restore those packages. I need to run some build command of some sort, um, probably within your package.json file or some npm script. I've got to package that up, get it ready to rock and roll, and I've got to publish it out. So those look pretty similar. The huge benefit for us choosing the Blazor side of things is this is the same build pipeline that we're using for every other .NET project we're using. So our MVC build pipelines look exactly the same as this. And this actually came from a template. It's not even just a single file. So when we right now, when we've got both our build, our back end and our front end, they're using a template file. So if I need to inject another step in there, so I need to run like a sneak vulnerability scan on my dependencies, it's really easy to do and it's worked in both places. So that's something that we would, you know, was definitely been a big win for Blazor for us. If we want to do that for Reactive View and you're splitting kind of those, those pipelines, you'd certainly have to go figure that out in a different language. So something to consider. I've got a huge list of honorable mentions. These aren't things that we spent a ton of time on, but I think they're worth considering still, especially today. Um, performance. Performance isn't always like the biggest deal breaker for us. You know, typically when we're building apps, it's for the tens of users, it's for the 25s of users, the hundreds of users. We're certainly not on the Google, the Facebook scale of what people are working on. So while performance is always in our mind, it was certainly not a deal breaker. And if you've ever worked with Blazor, that first load sucks. It is so painful. You gotta download all those DLLs into the browser and it's gotta cache them. After that, performance is great. No complaints there, but that first load is not gonna be fun. And if your users are not, ex are not ready for that and they're expecting a quick page load, that's gonna be something you're to, gonna need to communicate with them. Subsequent loads, loads after that, again, the browser caches them pretty aggressively, so it's not too bad, but that first load is not good. Kind of same thing on the React view side of things. You still gotta load that JavaScript, right? But typically it's gonna be quite a bit smaller. You know, the, the Blazor side of things, I've easily seen it 15 megs, so it, it can get pretty large pretty quickly depending on what you're pulling in. Browser adoption and like long-term support stability, especially from the browser adoption, we felt pretty safe here on both sides. Uh, Blazor WASM especially compiles down to WebAssembly, so WebAssembly is a standard. Okay, we feel pretty safe here. JavaScript's been around for quite some time, so again, felt pretty safe here. Didn't really feel too, too worried about that, especially from the browser adoption side of things. But the long-term support and stability, wanted to think about it a little bit. I don't know if anybody's ever worked with like Silverlight before, but um, I know some people probably have uh, horrible memories about that. Thankfully, we never built applications using Silverlight, so we dodged that, but nobody wanted to go through that again, right? Nobody wanted to get that email or that blog post saying, hey, it's going away, and there's nothing you can do about it. You're gonna to have to change your tooling, right? We didn't wanna change our tooling to then have to go do that again in a year, a year and a half. So that was something we wanted to consider here. And um, you know, we certainly felt pretty safe with Blazor, and especially from the React and Vue side of things, it felt pretty safe there too. Cross-platform development, not a huge concern here. They all kind of offered their own uh, cross-platform options. Um, Xamarin Forms was the option two years ago. It's now Maui. Um, React Native, Vue Native, I think is what it's called. So it's there. We're not doing it too often, but it's something to consider. Legacy app integration with Blazor, that's pretty non-existent from a legacy app integration. So if you've got a long-running production app and you kind of want to convert it over to Blazor, you're going to have to do some really tricky things to make that work. You're going to have uh, one sort of web application over here and then probably inject in some different routing to direct you to a Blazor application. And you're going to certainly feel that when you're doing it. So it's not really a legacy app integration, but um, you know that would be how you do it. But on the React and Vue side of things, it's kind of what they advertise, right? Oh, start with your big application, just peel away component by component, do it in React, and then push it back into your project, and you won't even notice. So that was definitely a win over there. Um, integration with the Microsoft Authentication Library, Microsoft Entra ID, Azure ID, they keep changing names on me. Um, 
this was something that we definitely needed to consider and was part of the pilot project, but not really like a you know forefront. It was just something that was a mandatory requirement, and it is for pretty much everything we do. We don't really build any public applications, so it's something that we needed to have. You know, our applications need to be protected by something, and that Azure AD, Entra AD, uh, is is what we typically use for our authentication. And then lastly, I've got Azure and AWS infrastructure. Again, there's, there's definitely some perspective here, right? You know, think about what you're doing and what you're trying to do in the cloud. If you're just building VMs out in the cloud, that's probably not the way to use the cloud. It's an option. You know, they give you those options, but it's probably not the option. Um, with the .NET side of things, the app services, the WAF, you know, things along those lines we were already really, really familiar with. The services out there for React and Vue were pretty similar. It's stupidly some learning curve there, but again, don't necessarily stand up VMs. And then same thing on the AWS side of things. The support for .NET in AWS has grown tremendously since .NET Core and moving into 5, 6, 7, 8 coming out next week. Um, so you know, we felt like the options were there, whether we knew about them or not, or had already used those services was a different story, but you know, the options were there. So that was, that was at least something to consider. Going into kind of a retrospective about our pilot project and everything that we had talked about, it was really, really clear to our team specifically what direction we were gonna head. After we sat down, kind of the compare contrast, what you like, what I like, you show me yours, I'll show you mine sort of thing, I think we all sat down and said, okay, on three, go ahead and say what, you're gonna, what you think our option should be. And we all said Blazor. It, it was a no-brainer for us. I kind of tried to put a scorecard up here, a grade card, a report card, whatever you want to call it, and again, remember this is definitely really biased. I'm not gonna tell you that, yep, this is the grade card for everybody's grade card. But for us, you know, it, it certainly seemed more green, more A's and B's in the Blazor category. So, thus we moved to Blazor. But again, kind of the moral of the story of this is be strategic about what you're trying to do. Don't just take that hello world or go to a conference tomorrow or today, walk away and say, hey, I saw this really cool talk on React. Let's go use React. Go deeper, right? Go a little bit deeper. Go past Hello World. Don't just rely on flipping a coin to pick out what sort of spa you're going to use moving forward. So that's uh, that's what we did. Hopefully, that's a little bit insightful. And go Blazor. But <laughs> now, I mean, at this point in time, I'll open up for any questions that anybody might have. Yes. Sure. Mm -hmm. Kind of from your scorecard perspective, were the same thing. And you yep. chose not to look at Angular. Yes. So yep. So the question was, why did we not look at Angular? Is that correct? Yeah. Yep. Um, boils down to there were three of us. <laughs> it is a short story. Now, um, you know, two years have passed and we've done an Angular project. We thought it's great. Would we have gone back and done things differently? It's hard to say. We're still really, really happy with Blazor, but to answer your question, the short answer is there are three of us, and we had to draw the line somewhere, right? There's a lot of different options out there. I'm sure there's a Java option, Java option, a Python option we could have picked, so um, you're right. React and Vue were very, very similar, so it just kind of fell to what, what we were kind of leaning towards at the time. Yes? Yeah, yep, so the question was, um, when building out our pilot project, how do we pick who did what, and how are we not being biased? That, um, yeah, that's tough. Uh, so specifically, the guy that did Blazor had never worked with Blazor before. Um, obviously, we were all .NET developers to begin with, so you know there was gonna be bias, but we were certainly very eager to at least explore React and Vue, right? We had seen and we've done a React project too since then too, and we've enjoyed it, but you know, it's really hard not to bring bias into it. I think we, we tried to be very, very clear on that up front, and you know, React was definitely a very close second. Um, I think definitely, I showed the slide with the calendars on it. That, I mean, that was a huge game changer for us. The learning curve that he went through, that, that time duration was, was a pretty big deal breaker for, for us. So, um, you know, it's hard. It is hard not to be biased, and we certainly were a little biased, but, you know, we had to put that aside to some extent because we were very close to choosing React, I think, at the end of the day, too. Yes? Sure. 
Sure. So the question is, um, when we're hiring, have we found, have we looked at people who are familiar with React and Vue and tried to convert them to Blazor? Um, not specifically. We do have some projects and some teams that are working on React. So our typically our recs that we're putting out are standard .NET recs. Um, so we haven't run into situations where we're putting out a React rec and saying, oh, okay, this person's got a bunch of React. Let's see if we can convert them to this. Um, because I think there's enough .NET users out there and .NET uh, developers. So um, specifically, we're not necessarily putting out recs for those React people. You know, if we run across somebody who's got a good React background, we, you know, sure, we'll have that conversation and stuff, but that may be more informal, um, something you'd, you'd cross somebody at a conference or, you know, at a bar or having a beer or something like that. Uh, but typically our recs that we're putting out are our standard .NET recs, and that's what we have found has worked. Um, again, kind of going back to that learning duration, it's, it's taken us about a week for most of these .NET users to really pick up Blazor and at least get running with some of our projects. So we haven't really found that, again, the Blazor question has always been kind of a bonus, but again, we haven't found a single person yet who has actually said, yeah, we've got Blazor background, so. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. Any concerns about that? Uh, yeah. To some, okay. So the question was, um, you know, the Blazor side of things definitely favored the Telerik grid. Are, are there any concerns with some of the more JavaScript-based um, things that you can do in JavaScript, like virtualization and, and things along those lines? So from the Blazor side of things, all that stuff is supported too. Um, so you can do virtualization on a grid, a lot of their autocomplete functions. Um, they're newer, you know, within the past year or so. They weren't necessarily there two years ago, but they're certainly there. And there's other options to do that natively with React too, or uh, sorry, with Blazor as well. It's not as straightforward, but there are ways to definitely tie into that. And then to that too, you know, you're not, you know, so siloed into Blazor. If you still need to write JavaScript to do something, you can do that. Um, so the mapping component example, we still have projects today with mapping components where we have to inject tons of JavaScript to do that sort of thing. So um, would those make more sense to do a React or a Vue? Probably, but um, we're still happy with Blazor. So, yes? It's okay. It's after lunch, I understand. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the question was, why did it come down to one over the other, or instead of you know, why not having maybe a hybrid approach or something along those lines? Um, I think really what this boils down to is, so typically we're building a lot of greenfield applications internally for our for ourselves and for our clients. Um, we have a lot of in projects that support internal clients and a lot of projects that support external clients. Um, if we have full say over what's going to happen, we're probably going to choose Blazor just because we have the most staffing available to it. We're most familiar with it, uh, especially now. But we, like I think I mentioned earlier, we have had projects where clients come to us and say, hey, we have an Angular application. You kind of clean it up for us and refactor it for us or add these features. So being consultants, we still are not going to shy away from that work specifically. So. I don't know if that necessarily answers your question, but you know, if we're choosing the tech stack that we're doing and we have full control over it, Blazor just makes more sense for our team specifically. Yes. Um, did I hear you say you guys did some of this investigation on evenings and weekends, or were you able to justify business time to do this work? I yeah, know. sure. Uh, so the question was, uh, I said that we did this over nights and weekends sort of thing. Could we justify this with you know business hours or during the day, right? Um, we probably could have. Now, we took the effort on this on our own behalf. Um, so from our company's perspective as being consultants, the most important thing is to bill a client for every hour that you're working, right? So that's just kind of the nature of a consultant. Um, could we have packaged this into during the day? Yeah, absolutely. But, you know, this is something that we were all pretty eager about. So, you know, working a little bit of nights and a little bit of weekends wasn't really that big of a thing. It, it was about two weeks at the end of it. So. It wasn't, you know, we spent months, years sort of thing trying to investigate this. And after kind of that two weeks, any new development we certainly did during the day and we definitely built to a client. All good questions. Anybody else have another question? Yes. How 
Yeah. Yep. Uh, so the question is, how does unit testing work for Blazor? Um, could, yes, it works really well in React, Vue. Um, unit testing definitely falls to the category of a nice to have for us. Uh, you know, we should do it more, definitely. <laughs> don't, tell, don't tell anybody that I said that, but um, there are options for Blazor unit testing. They're not as widespread as the JavaScript frameworks. Um, B unit would be the one for Blazor. I don't think it was there two years ago, but it certainly is now. It's okay. Um, most of our unit testing would certainly fall to probably more of the back end is where we're going to spend most of our time doing that unit testing, which uh, there's tons of libraries that are supported from the .NET side of things to do the unit testing on, say, your back end APIs. So, yep, good question. All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for your time today.